Hi, and welcome to Close Up with the Hollywood Reporter Actors. I'm Stephen Galloway, and I'd like to welcome Adam Sandler. Yes, sir. Robert De Niro. Hi. Adam Driver. Tom oh, Hanks. Present. Jamie Foxx. <laughs> yes, and Shia LaBeouf. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm sure you know this anecdote. Dying is easy. Comedy is hard. Mm. <laughs> True or false? Comedy is more difficult, yes. Yeah. I can't do what uh, Billy Crystal does, Eddie Murphy, uh, you, uh, Adam. But I can do other things. I mean, I like to think that I work in, uh, say, in Marty's movies, just situations that are funny in and of themselves, um, which is like life. You know, there are so many situations we see. We, we, we're, we're in a... We're in a situation, all of a sudden, you say, I wish we could have filmed this, or <laughs> yeah, this situation right. is so mm -hmm. crazy, you know, but it's real. So. Is there anything in real life you wish you could have filmed, or that you've then brought into a role? No, I mean, the, the only thing, say, with Marty Scorsese working with him is that you get closer to saying that whatever you want to do, you could actually try and do it, and, and maybe it'll happen, maybe it'll work. So if you had an idea or something, you say, let me, let me just try that. I say, Marty, let me, let's just try it, you never know. And, and so, it, you, you, it's, it's something, it, with some directors, you don't even go there. You don't even, you say, it's, it's too much huh. work to, to even <laughs> attempt to bring it up to them to do that. With Marty, it's, yeah, this is part, we'll do it, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah. So that's a great feeling of freedom, um, uh, and it's just great. Adam, you yeah. come from comedy. Yes. Comedy or dying? <laughs> yes, mm. yes. Which one's easier? Uh, uh, you know, uh, um, if you have something that uh, you, either way, something you're confident with, something that is, uh, seems like uh, you believe in it, I think it's the same feeling. If you believe in a joke, if you believe in a, a, a dramatic scene, you go in there with the same approach, I, I, I would think, right? Here's the, here's the thing. Comedy is a, is a natural thing. Like, I have just told him, I was watching him in the comedy store when I was 18 years old, sneaking in the comedy store, yeah. watching him go up when it was like Titans, it was rock. It was Eddie working out, you right. know, shit with it. I remember Eddie had on like a, like this yellow <laughs> fucking Century 21 jacket. <laughs> he was working on these dunks. And somebody, yo, what's up with that Century 21 jacket? And then you watch Eddie, like, he said, <laughs> oh, whatever, I'll crush you with my wallet. And then everybody oh, yeah, started laughing. Yeah. So it's interesting. When I look at everybody here, you know, it's this, it's this, it's respect. And then I look at Adam, I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> Before he even said anything, I'm already laughing so that's one of the first ingredients is that when you have this natural thing of watching him on his guitar in at mm. 1 30 in the morning mm. doing a bit that he's so dedicated to it <laughs> motherfuckers is like oh he's you know shit. so that's the first ingredient right that, oh, that's correct and then the second ingredient is as comedians you get a light like you get that lift off that launch where everything that you're saying it's funny, it's hilarious, like people are giving you that light. I think it only becomes difficult once you reach that top of mm. comedic level. Now people are expecting, you yeah. know, the world. You mm. know, when I, when I go talk to Eddie, I was at Eddie's house, uh -huh. uh, and he's talking about getting back in the, uh, into comedy, into stand-up. Yeah. But he's like, how do, you know, I said, well, I said, well, Eddie, if you want to get into it, I could, I could help you. First thing I do, you gotta fix your house. He's like, what you mean? I said, your house is too, too perfect. Right? <laughs> all your, 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 just too much. You got the candles scented and all that shit. I said, Eddie, at my crib, I have shit at my house that doesn't work on purpose, so I stay funny. I got this little carpet that's in the, in the, in the, uh, in the kitchen that's sort of ruffled up, and I got a bathroom where you turn on the faucet and it sprays out. And my daughter's like, why don't you fix it? I said, I feel like if I fix all this shit, mm -hmm. I won't be fun <laughs> so it's like you have to have that and then when he talked about the situation like when we're watching you know robert de niro the situation that you provide for him makes it all the way uh uh funny does that make mm -hmm. sense yes yeah. because now once you have the ability to be funny you need the situation in order for it to make sense because if not like, this is the worst thing in the world when the director goes like, okay, now just do your thing. 
Ooh. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And now you, you know, fucking, yeah, 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 yeah. you're that's doing why. your shit, and then when you watch it, you're like, I'm doing my shit, but it doesn't make sense. So that's the part when he says. Do they only say that in comedy, or do they say it in drama? Too? Yeah, oh, dear. Say, they all say, have fun with it, commit to it. <laughs> you know. can, can you be funny if you grew up with a built in swimming pool in your backyard? I don't think you can. If you grew up being able yeah. to swim, <laughs> Anytime you wanted to, right? You uh-huh. experience none of the shortcomings of life that you that you turn into self deprivation. That's right. You can't do. It's it. tough. Can and you j- play tragedy though? If you grow up, if you have it easy, doesn't it all come from some inner pain, angst? Everybody's. Yeah, pain. sure. You bet. <laughs> uh, uh, the 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 look. It's like Bertolt Brecht, man. The whole thing is a struggle, and there's where you where there's where you find your triumph. The, the, you hear the thing about the, that will kill us all at some point. Is it's three o'clock in the morning? And you have something very specifically that you know, you've known for months you're going to act this beat with this scene. And it's 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh-huh. it could be anything from rain birds going off to, you know, um, taxi cab drivers mm. or something like that honking horns. And it's like, all right, the movie is now upon your shoulders. Mm. Don't fuck wow. this up. Mm. And then they sit back and you wait and you got to go there, man. You just yeah. got to tragedy. Comedy. Is there a moment you can yeah. think of where that's just a tension? Oh, yeah, it happens ten times a <laughs> ten times a week really? sometimes, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, where mm-hmm. it's uh, everybody is kind of every everybody's making the same movie you are, you know, the crew, the Teamsters, mm-hmm. everybody knows that. Oh, today's the scene. You're gonna, you know, oh yeah. wow, this is gonna be a bill. Look, yeah, yeah, we mm-hmm. shut we shut down the whole street for this, <laughs> right, right. you know. All right, eleven o'clock. Okay, they're ready. We're gonna. Get, we're ready for a rehearsal. Hi, uh, please give me a gun oh. so I can shoot myself in the hip and not have to do this movie anymore. You played uh, a comedian uh, in the movie with Sally Field. Oh, punchline. Hey, the yeah. Safdie yeah. brothers told me to tell you that that's that they lo- love punchline. Is that right? That they love. They watch punchline a lot. Playing a guy who's supposed to be funny. The only way to do that was to go out and develop funny material, and I probably did six you know appearances of something where all i really did was jump up and down on a trampoline i had no sense of anything but you you were because i got it i saw you I put it training together. i saw you training i was young comedian yeah. at the comic strip and no. you used to come in and go up there with so and barry sobel used to yeah come yeah in. barry barry and i we we and yeah. i yeah. ended up and after a while was he good he not was, that night not if you saw me at the but comic no, strip, I, no I, I saw you a couple not. times and you were good you came up right away where the comedians were mad that you were calm on stage and cool <laughs> and, got, and you were being <laughs> yourself that took were a like, while yeah. to get there. But you, but you, you the best i can describe it is you just have to you just have to go there when i was in when i was in junior college taking acting classes and there's 10 of us there and we're all we've all been into the American Conservatory theater performances of certain things. And we usually look at comedies going, ah, oh, yes, that's very funny. Oh, I appreciate the work behind that joke. But the, uh, the, assignment, the assignment for one day was, okay, on Wednesday, everybody's going to come and you're going to be funny and you're going to make each other laugh. And it was stone, yeah. nothing. No one could do Different. anything funny because sure, that was sure. the task at hand. So comedy is hard because you know instantaneously whether or not your, you know, your soup is good food. Adam, you were in the military. See? Do these yeah, issues right away. <laughs> <laughs> acting in drama, dying or comedy, do they seem trivial in comparison? Well, I mean, one, the stakes you're pretending are life and death, and the other, they kind of are. But the way, the process in which you work on them is the exact same. It's, you know, a group of people trying to accomplish a mission that's bigger than any one person and you have a role and you have to know your role within a gun team and you you're only as good as the people that are are there with you there's someone leading it and when they know what they're doing what you're doing feels active and relevant and uh, exciting and when they don't it feels like a waste of resources and dangerous and you're you're just so aware that you're one part of a of a bigger picture Mm. how did you switch from being a marine to being an actor I, I was interested in it before uh, being in the military. Then when you get in the military, you get out, you kind of have all this false confidence that civilian problems will be small in comparison, which is an illusion. <laughs> but then I was lucky enough to get into an acting school and, like, and learned about acting and plays and uh, a process. And then, I, then I was lucky enough to work. Have you ever felt, Char, that, that act, there's a life and death moment in acting where your whole life depends on you pulling this off? Yes. Which one? Uh, every time. It feels like you're next on the chopping block every time. Hmm. How do you get past that anxiety? Uh, prep hard, yeah. It's like boxing. It's just like boxing. Guys train really hard to go put their neck on the line. Uh, never been in the military, but it feels life and death to me. Yeah, so prep hard, determination. 
Um, I went um, last year to the Harry Ransom Center. I don't even know what that is, but it's the archive at the University of Texas, which has great papers. And there are Bob's papers. And to actually see your handwriting on you know, the Raging Bull script. Mm. And it was amazing because your scripts are, are covered with notes. What was the toughest character you actually had to prepare for? They're all different. Depends. Depends. Some some are harder, and, or in some ways than others. And Raging Bull, because of the weight and all that, and the mission, just the physical stuff. Awakenings. There's a lot of mm. physical stuff too, and mm. studying how my character behaved and what what his affliction was. And then Raging Bull, I read the, the book. Somebody handed me the book, one of the authors, and, and I read it while I was doing once um, in 1900 with Bertolucci, and I, and I, and I called <laughs> Marty from Italy, and I said, you Late. gotta, you know, th the book's not great literature, but it's got a lot of heart. Mm -hmm. And I kind of want to do certain things. I remember I used to see um, Jake LaMotta, he, he'd work in a kind of a strip place mm -hmm. right on 7th Avenue in the 40s. He'd be standing right out there near the mm -hmm. sidewalk, and he was overweight and this mm -hmm. and that. And I said, Jesus, look at look what happened to him from then. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought just the graphic difference of being out of shape and then being a young fighter, really, the, that was interesting to me. I thought, you know, I'd like to see if I could really just gain that weight wow. actually mm -hmm. and, and do it. So that was my the interest in it. Marty had his reasons, and both of us just come together on the, the project, and um, yeah, so. Have any of you had a dream project that you've taken to a director or another actor and said, like, you must do this? Honey Boy, it's your project, you wrote it. Yeah. But if you haven't seen it, it's terrific. It's unbelievable. Hey, thank, thank you. you. And the man is so, uh, who did you want to do it with you? Uh, my back was against the wall. I was nuclear at this point, so it wasn't like a mm. dream project. It felt like, um, like survival, like there was no other way to go. I didn't have a lot of people talking to me. Mm -hmm. I was in a mental institution, so it wasn't like, oh, this is my dream project, I'd like to explore this. It was like, uh, my back's against the wall. Uh, this is the craft that I love and I can't do it anymore. And I also had a doctor who was pushing me to explore these dirty parts and write it down. And yeah, so it wasn't like a dream project thing, more, mm -hmm. more it felt more like necessity, like survival, like uh, something different. Mm -hmm. You said you're in a mental institution. Uh, I, I don't want to ask you two personal questions, but is there anything you discovered there that's been helpful for your acting? Um, yeah, empathy for my father, you know, mm -hmm. who was always the biggest villain in my life, you know, and I think if you can empathize with the biggest villain in your life and sort of scrape some of these shadows and it makes you lighter and freer. I don't think I was leading with love and my life has changed. You may or may not attest, but I feel like when you when you lead with lightness and love, you can get to the heavy easier. You know, it's much hmm. it's much easier, it's much more accessible. Like anger and the the rough shit is very easy. You know, it's the other stuff that that feels quite difficult. You know, get an honest laugh is very hard. Hmm. I tell you, when I have to laugh in a movie, I can't do that. Yeah, really? uh, it's tough. Nah. We do you mean, like laugh. If my like character is supposed laugh. to have a genuine laughing moment, mm. I, I'd rather do get a genuine anything else. Yeah. I'm always yeah. just like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> is it easy for to, for you to cry? You have that big moment uh, um, in Uncut Gems where you're really emotional. Was right. that easier than laughing? Uh, maybe, maybe not. I'm not great at crying. <laughs> <laughs> what are you no, great so at? <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't even think I should be at this table. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> no but but um. Uh, um yeah, crying when I when it's written in a script and then he breaks down and this mm -hmm. that kind of that really gets me tense for mm. for a while. You you sure. had a massive one in Marriage Story. Every time I see that performance of somebody breaking down, I'm like, oh man, that guy, that's incredible. How did you get to that point? It's not something you push for. You don't push for emotion. It, mm. just, it either happens or it doesn't. Mm. You, know? you can't like anticipate it or, or nothing will happen. But mm. you know, there's a lot of things that in that instance are supporting you. You're, the script is so good and it's well written. Mm -hmm. If it was badly written, there's only one way to do it. If it's well written, you know, the language is so rich yeah. that every time you say it, it opens up an idea yeah. for something else. And because Noah has structured, and Adam knows this from working with, Noah and Meyerowitz, that the text is the text, and I find that incredibly mm. freeing because your intention could be anything. And if you're with another 
actor is Scarlet in that instance, and the, you know the, the set Noah is giving you another piece of information that maybe you hadn't thought of before, mm -hmm. or the line, or you, you got in a fight with your mm -hmm. wife before the scene starts, or, or, mm -hmm. or maybe nothing. Maybe you're, you're having a good moment before the scene starts. It just opens up your imagination of a different way of of reading it. You know, he's taken basically a four month run of a play and condensed it to two days, mm -hmm. you know, so that I think that's easier. If it's just have an emotion, I don't think I can do that. Do you take that emotion home with you? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, it's like I, I a don't release know. after it's yeah. done. Yeah. Yeah. Take yeah. the exhaustion yeah. home. Yeah. Yeah. No, right, right. Yeah. no, so I mean, it's a release. It's like you did that, that's there, take a break, come back. Sometimes though, there is a residual something that you have to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Mm. I think uh, as an, as an <clears throat> for you too, Tom. There is a it's a physiological process that incorporates your emotions in your, the sinews of your body. It's funny, laughing and weeping are two very physical acts. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, they're they're not they're they're not <laughs> yeah. up here. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, when I cry, man, my face turns yeah. into rubber. Oh, and, yes, yes. You know, you bend over and some kind of thing, um, <clears throat> and you can only you can only get there. If the, literally the text takes you there, and there's this great commonality of of moments like that, in which, like I said earlier, everybody's making the movie, and everybody knows that tonight or this day is going to be an emotional thing, and mm -hmm. your job is to forget that it's on a schedule, mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. live it and be it, and don't don't you can't you can't push it. It actually mm -hmm. has yeah. to ha has to come out. Well, I'm just I'm just emotional. Mm. Yeah, I'm always crying. I'm just really. Like, yeah, oh, I yeah. just I cry for everything. That's mm. great. I don't know, but I'll be crying about stuff that really my accountant just called me and said you. <laughs> you, <laughs> access. you don't have. You tried to buy a private plane. This shit like, like mm. fuck. Run the scene. <laughs> so it's like you know, I mean, you know, I should be going through you know, my life. Access all. Yeah, you know, should be get that call. Life, <laughs> just ruins the game. Shit bro. is going on in my life, so I'm easy. I cry easy. What's but, been your toughest moment? I think the toughest thing being a comedian is watching other comedians blow. Like Eddie blew up. Oh shit, you know. And then uh, you know Martin. And so I'm like, okay, where's my where's my thing? Uh -huh. But then you see that they've touched all of the comic bases. I remember going into reading for Russell Simmons uh -huh. for some for some comedy, and I was doing my thing, and he was going, oh, that's, that's that's Eddie. <laughs> oh. oh, that's Martin. That's Martin. That's Martin. That's Martin. Yeah. Oh, no, no, wow. no, that, no that, that's Rock. That's Rock. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and he was, no, I was just saying, you, you, you sound like Chris Rock. You sound like Eddie. Uh -huh. So that was tough because I was like, damn, I don't have nowhere to go, right? <laughs> and then like, you know, this cool thing where Oliver Stone opened up. It was, you know, this any given Sunday thing, mm -hmm. which was more dramatic. Oh, and yeah. and so, I don't know if that's a tough thing, but it was just like, man, let me. Let me go get with him, and it that was an incredible. It path. opened up a whole other thing, yeah. and then the tough part was getting back to being funny. Mm. Yeah, oh. yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, because like you know, mm. like the young folks, they see me like, oh, here's this dude using Django. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. And now I'm doing jokes. And man, why Django being funny like that? Dog? So That's it's like, funny, so yeah. now I have to try to get back to. Um, what about you? Do you find that hard too often? I've done so many comedies. Mm. Also, I have so many yeah. comedies on TV. I, I don't have a hard time getting back into that. Yeah. People are just, it, when I get to do something like this, like uh, Uncut Gems, and yeah. I, I, I haven't done that many uh, dramas. Maybe I've done like six or seven uh, over 30 years worth. I'm always excited doing them. It's a different excitement for me because I'm not sure of myself. Yeah. I, you know, uh, when you do comedies, you kind of, I mean, you grew up doing them. Shia yeah. grew up as a kid being in, in uh, yeah. comedies. It's a different, lighter feel on the set. It's exciting. There's nothing better for a comedian than going home and going, oh, I think we killed that scene. Right. That's going to be funny as hell. Audience is going to like that. But this um, a drama man, getting it right and feeling like you gave it your all and that excitement of reading uh, script and going, oh, that scene's going to be incredible. Then actually shooting it and it comes out the way you want it to, or maybe not exactly the way you wanted to, but something happened big for you, that's, that's as good Are as Are you gets. hard on yourself? When it doesn't come out that way, do you go yes. home and torture yourself? Oh my God, you, if, you, I, you, if there's <laughs> something great written that, that, that uh, I don't think I, get, I, I got to where I was supposed to get, I'm really mad at myself. You too? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're disappointed. Mm. The only thing is that you, to, like, like you were mm. saying, you don't push for anything. I mean, I don't, I, if you push, you're not gonna get it. So you just have to take what comes and try and find ways to get there, but you just can't be anxious about it. You know, it's like, 
the, the thing, you know, the, the actor, he can't remember his lines, so he can't act anymore. So he's working in a garage and somebody, uh, an actor, a director comes over and says, listen, I, I just want you to say, Hawk, I hear the cannon roar in the third third act, you know. So, so I said, okay, so I'll go do it. He goes, yeah, so he rehearsed, rehearsed, and then at home, you know, he's working, Hawk, I hear the cannon roar, Hawk, I hear the cannon roar, Hawk, I hear the cannon roar. Every variation, every way he's ready, the third act, ready to go after five weeks rehearsal. He goes backstage, he's ready, you know, the first act goes, no problem, he's waiting, Hawk, I hear the cannon roar, Hawk, I the second act, everything, I like that. fine, third act, he's there backstage. And stage magic comes, okay, you ready? And he's hearing the play out there, and he's going, boom, go out. He's going up saying, Hawk, the Hawk, the Cannon Wall, Hawk, the Cannon Wall. Then you hear, bang, turns around. What the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> Are you self critical? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't think that you ever get over because, in a way, you kind of know what your potential is more than anybody else. In, in a sense, I have a lot of regret. Often, when you leave a set, you can't help but, you know, think about it. And you know, obviously, it's film, so film is forever. So you never get a chance to go back and do it again. I feel like that's that's the thing about acting is that you, regardless of how often you do it or how long you do it, you never figure it out. That Even in the, do you, do you prefer theater because of that? Or? I've learned from theater in that, you know, you always at the end of a four month run of a play, you're always the last performance. It's always the best one. And you're like, okay, now I have a better sense of what I want to do and go back. So I know that there's no right answer. There's no right way to play a scene. That's my part of it. I like the making of it. And it's, someone else's responsibility to make the choice of what is the best version of it. But mm. I, I know that there's mm. n n no right way. And I, I, you would just have to feel comfortable with, with failing. And, and you either get easier on yourself, I think, about like, okay, then I'll just, I'll let it go, or, or you don't. But I, I don't think you will, you'll ever figure that out. Well, so I think uh, people keep doing it, I think. <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Tom. <laughs> Are you self-critical if you go home and um, arrive, or? I, I, it, there have been too many times where I thought I really cracked something over the fence, and then I saw it and I said, well, that, that is just, yeah, well, wow. no, that, that's yeah. as exciting as a yeah. closing door. Yeah. And there's other times that I had no, I, I didn't, I didn't, I, all I could do was stumble around today. I, and it's fantastic. Mm. And you, there's no, con, it's odd, this, you almost have no control. Yeah. For me, it, it has come down to whether or not the the procedure and the behavior that was asked of you is authentic. Mm -hmm. And if it is, then you got to leave it up to serendipity. And those, that, those fabulous people that w are willing to look at your, you know, every eyebrow mm -hmm. and pour on your face and decide what's going to be the best take or what, what, what's going to end up being in the movie. Do you know when it directs? I would even say, in a way, sure. it's not even your job, uh -huh. really. I mean, I, yeah. I think it's, um, it's not your job to feel and anything, it's the audience's job. So it, I obviously you've been thinking about something for a long time and you finally get there and do it. You want to feel something just because you feel like you put the effort in, but it's, it's not really my responsibility to feel something. It's to telegraph that something <clears throat> is being felt, you, you know, but you, it's hard to reconcile that, to, to not feel like you got there and you actually, it's, it feels like it's gonna be more authentic, but I mean, to, to your point, it, you could be having all the feeling you want, but no one is feeling anything. And, that, and you, your job is to tell the story, not have a feeling in front of people. <laughs> when, we were, when we were doing uh, Captain Phillips and we were in this lifeboat, the script had all these great moments where Rich Phillips looked through the porthole of the lifeboat and as the sun was going down and was thinking of his family at home and whether or not he was going to see them. <laughs> so you could sit around in Malta, you know, where we were shooting, and say, oh, that's going to be a powerful moment. Cause <laughs> You know, I'm going to line up in the porthole and just going to be like this. You know, it's going to be really great. Then you go to work and there is no porthole in the lifeboat. <laughs> so it's a, so it, it, you, you got to like take away. It's almost so you cannot prepare. You can only just be there. The movie process, it's a little bit different if you know what I mean it's, mm -hmm. a, it's like you mean in theater or? just not even that just like when I was on in, uh, uh, any given Sunday I remember Oliver Stone when I first auditioned was like you're horrible when I auditioned mm -hmm. and, and I was like what because I was a television actor so everything I did was loud. Yeah, so you better understand this with the football in the air, man. <laughs> and he was like, he was like, get the fuck out of here. All of it can be tough. Huh? Yeah. All of it can be tough. No, but it was, 
but I learned from that toughness, hmm. meaning like when he finally decided to, you know, make the decision for me to be the lead, he still would grill me. He said, that's not it. That's hmm. not it. That's not it. Like working with Quentin Tarantino, and I watched an actor struggle because the, the set was like, it was heavy. I mean, you had, you had Samuel Jackson here, you had Leo. I mean, it was some juggernauts, you know, and Samuel, come on, motherfucker, say that shit. Yeah. And the dude, was, <laughs> the dude was trying to say, come on, come on, oh, get it. Oh, yeah. And the guy was trying to get his line, Ooh. and I watched Quentin Tarantino go to him, no, tell me everything's fine, just go to the same line. Right, yeah. And I was like, damn, this shit ain't gonna work out, right? But then you see the movie. <laughs> I said, God damn. And Quentin said, All I need is one. Sure. Even yeah. working with Christoph, Chris, Christoph was watching him work, I learned a little more about movie. I watched him fold a paper. Some motherfucker wrote on a thing and was just supposed to put it in his pocket. It seemed like it took him forever to do it. He was like, <laughs> <laughs> And he had, it was nothing else existed but that moment, right? Christoph Waltz's process wasn't that I'm gonna have all of these things memorized and do all of these things at once. He would give you these, and calm yourselves, gentlemen, I, mm. one more time. <laughs> calm yourselves, gentlemen, I am but a weary traveler. And we were watching it and Leo was like, <laughs> I said, Leo, you think you got it? He's got something, pal. <laughs> Just keep watching. Some shit is going on, pal. And it, you see all these little bits of things, and then all of a sudden in the movie, boom, calm yourself, mm. gentlemen. I was like, oh, shit. And then I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> <laughs> I like it about all of it because you hear so many stories about people who've worked with them. Who Shy has most intimidated you that you've worked with, and who have you learned from the most? Everyone's intimidated by Oliver, right? Yeah, different. N not intimidated. Okay. He's, he, he, would, he would never look me in the eyes. He always looked just above my eye, oh. the eyelid. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Why? Uh, it's just his way. Uh, maybe just with me. But um, probably, probably being around Hardy. Hardy's a bit of a gorilla on a set. Tom know? Hardy. Yeah, mm. probably. Uh, I, was, I was most intimidated by him, yeah. What do you mean a bit of a gorilla? Well, he, he runs a set, you know, he pee in the corners. It's his set. You know it when you get there. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, don't feel like a shared space. It feels like his space. Oh. And, <laughs> and, you know, and he's a very good actor. And, and also super loving, but on a set, oh. it's, you're in his church. Oh. Mm -hmm. you know? Who has taught Hallelujah. you the most? Bob. Really? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I, think I really like that. I'm not surprised. <laughs> we, yeah. we could all yeah. just be quiet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have some great actors around this table. Let's let's face it. Well, and what did he teach you? Uh, well, uh, through the performances, I watched him reveal himself and be a, a, a presenter of a soul and explore who he was through the work. And uh, I don't. I've always just uh, he made it feel sacred to me. So I, so it, it felt like, like he lifted the craft into something that felt like a. It's, it's wild to hear you say you're not religious, but I know you're spiritual, and I don't have to ask you because I watch the work and I can feel it. So mm -hmm. I'd say, and not to you know, kiss ass, but uh, through the work, uh, having a guy to look towards. Yeah. Are you intimidated by anyone? Mm -hmm. um, well, there's always somebody. I guess. Who? I, I, I don't know. Now I know. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I, I, as you get older, you don't want to be intimidated by anybody who shouldn't intimidate you. Mm. If you, uh, you know, we're in a political situation now. We have the best example of that, where I feel that you must stand up to this kind of person. Uh, not to make a speech about this mm -hmm. here, but it's it's necessary to stand up and not because people are nonplussed. It's like they say, "Did this guy just do that?" He did it. I, I don't even know how to rea react to that because I'm like, that's not within my world of common sense or, or right and wrong or what's being fair. So I, I have to find a way. I just have to. You gotta you gotta push him back. You gotta you gotta snuff him out. You gotta get rid of him. He's a, he's a, you know, it's it's you gotta deal with it because but people are so so nonplussed by this behavior, uh, and that's how crazy people like him can get even further. Imagine him getting a second term. He'll want, he's even said, I want to be president for life. 
he joked about it. With, uh, yeah. And so then he'll he'll go for that. He'll he'll pardon himself. He'll do anything. <laughs> I thought in the beginning, you know, well, you know, he's a New Yorker. Maybe he's got common sense somewhere in there. He's a liberal, actually, supposedly. But then, you know, after he, you know, he just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And we, we we've got to get rid of him. Adam, mm -hmm. should actors be political? Uh, I'm not great at that. I, 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 I listen to Bob talk and I, I go, okay, I listen to, I, I have, I, when I, when I, I, my conviction is not great. I do, I do believe in, uh, I, my, my way of being, uh, I just try to be a, as good of a person I can be and try to conduct myself mm. a certain way. I don't think I always do that right, but uh, when it comes to me discussing politics, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm knowledgeable enough to, to go at it. It's an interesting thing because it's actually not politics. What he's talking about is mm. me letting my kids watch someone who is supposed to be mm -hmm. from mayor, whatever, whatever. Mm. they're supposed to be different. He's not talking about policy. He's talking about the human nature of things. And so we should all have an opportunity to say or not say, but I, I got kids, so I gotta tell my kids, I say, hey, listen, this is not the way things are supposed to be when it comes to the human nature of it. Because when you do ascend to these levels of, of running things, we look to that. Look, all of what, we, uh, what we've gone through in our lives as, as American and politics, we were always able to look at that office and say that's something to aspire to be and to be like if i can't let my kids listen to that person talk then that's mm -hmm. where we're off so it's not actually politics there's nothing wrong with saying hey i'm like this you can have a different you can have a, a disagreement with me about policy we can both do that because i got good old boyfriends that are that are red <laughs> state guys and i got Democrat friend. I'm a Democrat, but I'm in all of those circles because I'm always performing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And quietly, even if we disagree, there's always that point of being a man, being, being nice, being kind. And so to his point, when you see something where a person <coughs> is, bless you, when a person is just, yo, you don't have to dance in the end zone with everything. <coughs> God me. bless you again. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, God bless you. But, but I think that's, that's what it is. And then we all get nervous. You know, we get nervous because, well, what's, what's, what are people going to say about me? But then if we don't have someone saying something, bless you again. <coughs> Man, I don't bless know where you. that came from. Bless you again. It's all good. But if, if we don't have someone... <laughs> no, I don't got it. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah. But you understand know what I'm saying? So it's like, um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's not politics. It's human beings. It's like I know. I, I look. I, I, I can share this story. I did a gig for Jerry Jones, who's I'm a cowboy, huge cowboy fan. And I had to perform for the. Uh, uh, for the owners in the NFL. And Jerry Jones' uh, son-in-law said, what are you gonna do here? I have to perform for, you know, you know, some good old boys. And I said, don't worry about it, I'm good, I'm from Texas, I, I, I think I'll be good. So the first thing I sung was George Strait. Man, oh, man. next thing you know, by the end of the night, I had everybody singing Gold Digger and blaming on it, I got Colin Powell singing. But I got a chance to speak with George Bush. I'm this close. And I was like, I, we spoke. And of course, we all had our differences, but I asked him something. I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this story. I said, would you ever say anything disheartening about President Obama? And you know what he said? No, I wouldn't. It's too hard of a job. I learned so much. I would never knock his legs out from under him because I know what it is. Wow. And then I watched him and his kids play with Obama's kids. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we're being, if we're taking it yeah. there, that's what it's at. So it's just a, it's a matter of everybody has something that they want to say, but we shouldn't be afraid to say it. You're not going to be, we should just say, hey, man, that's just so, ain't cool. So, you, so when Ellen DeGeneres went to the game with George W. Bush, do you think that's okay? Listen, it's bigger than that. When we're in, I've seen, I've been in football games where Jesse Jackson, George Bush, everybody, it, we're, they're still humans. But what happens is, it's an interesting thing. When you see what media does, they always separate and make it something bigger. Mm -hmm. Ellen is sitting with 
George Bush, who she's known for for years, that's it's, it's not a big thing. Still doesn't still doesn't mean she's going to compromise what she believes in, right. and it, you don't have to do that. But I think I think um, it's always been that way. Only now it's just different because you do go like, wow, that ain't cool. Mm -hmm. Even if you felt that way, that part ain't cool. You know what I'm saying? So it's like. Um, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be afraid. We look look and, and like people say like oh he's a snobby actor, you know, you know elitist. What the fuck are you talking about, man? I came from Terrell, Texas. Mm -hmm. No money, no nothing. I said nothing snobby about me. I'm happy that I'm making my money. I said but for me to get to a position of where I'm at right now and not say nothing, mm -hmm. like what you know. So I'm like I said I'm not running for office, but damn we should be able to say whatever we want to say. When we want to say it. Does that make sense? Yes. Tom, you had a little Freudian cough going on there. Uh, it <laughs> was, I don't know where that came from. I, it, it was a cough of agreement, what was going on. We all have... Shut up. <laughs> 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 uh, 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 I'm going to give you three more <laughs> of them. <laughs> no, uh, those are freebies <laughs> after that. <laughs> but... Um, not everybody should be political, but everybody must be principled. And exactly. we carry mm. our principles with us in exactly. 24 hours a day. It's part of the countenance. It's a part of, part of why yeah. we do what we do in the first place. And it's in our, it's in our choices. And I, I, I have to say, one of the things I learned from the get-go uh, as an actor in a, a repertory company, people you worked with, you didn't have to like those people, and you did not have to agree with those people. You didn't have to hang with those people. But you had to respect those mm. people. You had mm. to respect their process, and you had to respect um, their opinions. And the default setting, I think, for so much of everything is conflict. And, and uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Cynicism. Mm. Uh, that's the first place I think everybody can go. So if, if Ellen is at a football, at a, at a game with George W. Bush, what's the cynical take on what that is? Right. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> as opposed to is what is the respectful take on that. Mm. You know, I'm not going to assume anybody automatically did, agrees with each other because they're at a Dallas Cowboys yeah. or an Oakland Raiders football game. Um, okay. And I, I think that's that's a that's a different, and then also you know kind of like politics, you know, political views are a dime a dozen. You know they're absolutely everywhere. So. You just played the least cynical guy, maybe <laughs> in history. Uh, is it actually harder <laughs> yeah. to play someone that nice than to play a villain? Uh, they're the same exact beast, mm -hmm. you know. The, granted, the, Mr. Rogers is not Iago, but they have their principles and they have their they have their mission statement. The the, the story in the movie is really about the journalist that is very cynical about who Mr. Mm -hmm. Rogers is, mm -hmm. and finds out that he was wrong. <laughs> Just mm. and there's no nefarious motivation between what Fred Rogers did for a living. He viewed it as his ministry, and that's like kind of like looking at some combination of Mother Teresa or somebody that is, is hell-bent for doing just good mm. in, in the sphere of which they operate. And the cynic walks into that and says, what's your, what's your, what's your racket here? What are you trying to pull here? And if it's actually just, well, we're trying to feed the homeless people some soup so they get some a hot meal once a day. No, there's got to be something more to that. Mm. There's not. And the, the, um, Fred Rogers was an ordained minister, and his principle was such that everything that guided him through his daily behavior and his creative output was based on making people feel safe and a part of something bigger than they actually were. In his case, two- and three-year-old kids. But he never, ever said the word God. Not in mm. not in mm. hundreds and hundreds mm. and hundreds of hours of uh, of television. When you explored that character, was there a darker side in him that 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 actually pushed him in the other direction? There was the same dark side in him that is in any cracked vessel in, of of humankind. Mm. There is doubt. There <clears throat> there is uh, there is a sense of failure. There is always a degree of self loathing. There was mm. always a question of, am I doing enough for the people that I love? Mm. Now. Is that a dark side? 
I don't know that it's dark. And look, not everybody says, I'm growing tired of this game, Mr. Bond. Mm -hmm. Perhaps yes. you'd like a tour of our installation before mm -hmm. we feed you to the sharks. Mm -hmm. Not every, there, that is, that is, I think that's a dynamic that comes about, and that's, you know, Shakespeare wrote that kind of stuff left and right. But the journalist who came to talk to Mr. Rogers was paying that, no, 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 there's something in the past, and you're doing this for some mm -hmm. reason in the future. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, an artificial uh, accounting that is required by somebody who is not the person themselves. Bob, when you're playing a guy who's killed people, as you just did, and it's a real, based on a real life mm. man, is it good for you personally to find the goodness in him, or is that a dangerous proposition? I, I don't think, I mean, he was a guy who happened to have seen a lot of combat in the Second World War, mm. so he was a little, he was inured to killing more than but someone else, and he found himself in this world that was not what he was from, and it fit, and he uh, was loyal to the people that uh, gave him the love and support and uh, respected yeah. him, and, and um, so that's how, and then he was, in, then he had a big conflict, um, which later on, not to give it away, but <clears throat> that was the, the whole thing. But I, I think the whole story, the story is very simple, uh, you could find that kind of situation in any uh, culture. Loyalty, betrayal, love, uh, all, all those things are there. It, it, the price in this world is a little more harsh, um, but you know, that, 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 and maybe not so in certain parts of the world. I mean, this is, this is what happens. So we have it in this country, in America, in that, in that, that milieu, that culture. It's 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 uh, what it is. Um, so your loyalty in the in the movie, to your to your work, it was very interesting to see how it affected your home life and your daughter. In yes, the movie. yes. Yeah, that was what what was very interesting and different to the fact that you know a person would love you for what what you do and how much you believed in in doing the right thing for the guys you were employed by. Right. And that, but. At home, it was affecting the the family, and it's, it's heartbreaking. Heartbreak. Well, your, your your movie does the same thing. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, that, right. That, that yes, relationship that you life. have with your two boys and yeah. and your wife, man, who is just so completely done with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, it, and the, <laughs> she in real life tough. is a dominatrix. I heard. No, uh, maybe not. Um, we'll come back to the yes, yes, she not, is. Who is? Who is it? In, 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 in the actress in the film you play with. Oh, I, 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 you have to ask her, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to check that before we... Yeah, 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 you yeah. might want to be yeah. Adam specific <laughs> I don't want to be sued. Yeah. 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 Adam yeah. Sandler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you said something about you, editing. How really? much research did you do for that part? Did you go <laughs> into yeah. the... Let's, let's <laughs> give Adam a test. How much is Jenny's watch? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a real thing. I would... You know, this is a gift. Instagram. That's a gift from... No, somebody just told me post, and I was like, hey. Yeah. That's oh, a there good you one, go. Shia. That's a good one. That's what you want to get. <laughs> <laughs> Did you spend a lot of time? I with spent a lot of time, of course. Really? Yes, I what worked surprised out. you about that? Well, I'll tell you, like Shia said, when you're doing it, when you do the research and you come into a project and you know everything, and what Mr. De Niro was saying, when you see, um, when you walk onto a set and you know you've done the, the homework and you, you have no fears of like, oh, if this comes up, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be, sh I'm gonna shut down. It's just great to, to so I, of course, I spent a lot of time on 47th Street. I gamble in the movie a lot, so I spent mm -hmm. a lot of time with a lot of gamblers Did who you? had bad problems and lost mm -hmm. a lot of things and lost their lives because of it. And uh, The gamblers you met, who, who most surprised you or? Well, uh, uh, the Safdie brothers, the guys who did the movie, they did the research and met a lot of guys who were willing to sit down with me and talk. And there was nothing, you, it, it's, it's just their lives get thrown away and their family lives get thrown away. Mm -hmm. And it's about where they are right now. And, and they discussed what, what the highs and lows were and, and why they couldn't stop and that kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. All these guys on the block let me in, in their shops and I got to sit with them and watch them and they taught me about the, the jewelry and about selling, and I watched them all day long, and it was, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun, a lot of, a lot of, it felt neat to learn this new. It wasn't boring. Well, no, not at all. It's good to learn something. I walked away thinking I know everything. Mm. Right now, it's a year later, I'm like, I, I, I forgot so much. Mm. I, I wish I didn't. Mm. 
When you you played a real life character, yeah. how when you're playing that role, how much do you have to be faithful to him, and how did you? It's you know think you, differently. You, the, the, the the process of playing somebody real, you have to sort of not do the impersonation because I'm like you know coming from like the mm -hmm. living color background. I learned <laughs> not to do the impersonation, and then also not to. I didn't, I didn't have a chance to see him actually alive, but I had to sort of like piece things together through what people would say. Mm -hmm. And then the first thing that helped me was aesthetically, we are part of the same tribe in a sense, our cheekbones, our, the diamond shaped head, the, that haircut that he had, I had that in the 80s uh, as well. So aesthetically, mm -hmm. we, were, we were ahead of the game. I didn't have a chance to see him actually alive, but I had to sort of like piece things together through what people would say. Mm. And then talking to Brian Stevenson and hearing him talk about who's how- Who's the real life attorney. Who's the real life attorney. That the film's based on. Who, you know, goes and meets this, this guy on death row and finds out all these incredible, these horrible things that he's on death row without a trial. They say he killed a white woman in the city they didn't ever been in. And like, it, he couldn't believe that this existed. But he told me how Walter was. He felt like, you know, since I'm in this situation, uh, I might as well do everything I can to help. So when you see in the movies talking to all the prisoners and everything like that, trying to keep up their morale, these guys on uh, death row. So I took that as the, the spirit of it. And then it was a matter of the vernacular, being in um, you know, Alabama and the way they talk like that, you know, they, the way they say their things. And, you know, and to make that not be caricature. Like I remember Michael B. Jordan, listen, now nah, don't do that. Because it started sounding like, um, something to, 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 where we really couldn't understand me. So we sort of dial that in. So sometimes you have to rely on the people that are around mm. you to say what, what makes the most sense. That and real experience to, to draw upon. I mean, uh, you know, I was ex my, my father came to the, one of the screenings who, you know, he was educated for 25 years in the hood in, in, in high school and everything he dedicated his life to saving black kids in the hood. They end up putting him in jail for $25 worth of illegal substance for seven years. Wow. So here he is in jail with kids that he had taught. Wow. Mm -hmm. The very judge that he would bring into the school and say, hey, I want you to wow. shake these kids up. Tell them the repercussions of anything. That judge presided over his case, wow. put him in jail. Mm -hmm. So. When you have something like that, the person that taught you how to throw a football, the, the black man that taught you how to play tennis in Texas, when we weren't allowed to go to the, um, uh, the country club, I said, well, I got to learn tennis because you don't know all of this. You don't know how to swim, tennis, all of the, the stuff that they say we can't do, you do. And uh, so that was, a, that was a huge thing that I carried inside. I didn't share it with a lot of people mm -hmm. because when my pops, I wrote him one letter because I I was telling somebody, I don't like to see people in jail. I wrote him one letter, you get out, I'll save your life. He came to live with me. When he went in, I wasn't who I was. When he comes out, I'm, and I got a chance to take him to the US Open and have him watch Venus play, right. you know? And you know, watch the tears, you know, down it. So those types of things. Now, I was lucky enough to be able to have that moment. But in Walter McMillan's situation, you know, it works out, but it doesn't work out. It's still an entertaining movie, but you still sit with like, wow, Walter McMillan didn't, didn't have a chance. And there's a lot of Walter McMillan. You shot in a real life prison, yeah. right? Because those prison scenes are phenomenal. They're really incredible. Uh, did you, ever you have think- had, you ever, The one moment when the cuffs was being put on me and they had a guy who was part of the prison system uh -huh. who wasn't part of the movie. Yeah, yeah, squeeze it tighter. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Squeeze it tighter, because he's a, he's a bigger one. Mm. Squeeze it tighter. He doesn't know that he's saying something that is taking me to, yeah. like, I'll come out these cuffs. <laughs> yeah. But that's his everyday life. Uh -huh. So those moments when we were going into those prisons, that was for a person who don't, I don't, I don't, I don't do the jail shit. You know, there was a couple of times I was like, hey man, don't squeeze them, don't, they're tight enough. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So he doesn't know that he's saying something that is taking me to, yeah. like, I'll come out these cuffs. <laughs> yeah. But that's his everyday life. Uh -huh. We become so used to it, too, because we're talking to Brian, Brian Stevens and talking about changing the perception because the perception kills us. It's like 
The reason I don't want to go see somebody in jail is because I don't want to get used to that. But so many people are just used to seeing their father, their brother, their, who are their mothers in jail. And the next thing you know, we start rapping about it. We should rap about being in jail because we, we don't have any other thing. This is all we see. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it was a tough, mm -hmm. it's a tough thing, you know? Such a wonderful film. You. Um, you played your own father. Uh, yeah. And he was, I don't know if this is fair, but it seems that in your real life, he was a pretty villainous guy. Um, oh, I don't know. Is that true? No, he's sweetheart. He's a teddy bear. He's just a little crooked. Okay. <laughs> uh, cracked did, did you? He's just a crack. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. All, that's did you, right. But there's a lot of cracks there. Yeah. Did you? Um, did you have to change how you saw him to play the role? And did playing the role change the way you saw him? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I hadn't talked to my dad for seven years before I uh, started this up, so I didn't really, I didn't really know my dad too well, and. Um, didn't have a relationship with him at all. And, and uh, my coming into this industry, uh, you know, my dad wanted to be in this industry. It sort of separated us, you know? There was like a lot of, a lot of competitive, uh, me and my dad were quite competitive with each other. Mm. And um, yeah, I guess, I guess uh, yeah, I guess you always gotta empathize with whoever you're playing, but I wouldn't call him a villainous character, no way. Yeah, and I hadn't really looked at him from that side, you know? I was, young and, and in a victim type of, you know, uh, uh, I was using my dad at work, you know, which was the wrong way to go about work, but also well, the wrong way to What do you mean you were using father. him? Well, you know, um, uh, I was working with material that wasn't necessarily, you know, bomb back. And this <laughs> material would ask of you things that you couldn't really get in the material, so then you're left with, and I didn't have any technique, and uh, I had read all these uh, stories, you know, um, Easy Riders, Raging Bulls, and you know, you, you, you kind of, you come up with an amalgamation of a way to do something, and for me it was a lot of transposing my pain from my father, and it, it would work in front of the camera for me for a long time, and didn't have much more technique than that, and then was scared to sort of clean it up, because I thought, well, you know, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna lose my only thing mm. I got, which was this pain that felt very real for me. And so, um, yeah, I had, I had a whole mixed bag of, of um, I had a, a, a strange way of viewing my pain with my father, and I also used, used it at work, so I didn't want to clean it up, yeah. Hmm. Has it changed your thinking about him or anything? Yeah, yeah. And, and made me better at my craft and hmm. created a relationship, and yeah. Did you ever think of n not playing the part, and did you ever think of directing it? Never thought of directing it, because that's just not my gig, but um, definitely didn't think I'd be able to play it, you know. I was not in a spot where people were like, hey, let's put some money on this kid's back mm. and have him carry a movie. So I thought my acting career was done. I was going to join the Peace Corps. I wasn't really trying wow. to. Yeah, I was out really? completely. Yeah. And um, yeah, sent it to Mel Gibson. And mm. yeah, I thought he was the guy to play my dad. And uh, my dad was also thinking along the same lines. It's one thing to want to play your dad. It's another thing to go s stand in front of your father after seven years of not talking and go, hey, man, I'm going to play you. Mm. when there's contention yeah. already and we weren't on good terms so I lied to him and told him hey Mel Gibson's gonna play you sign right here <laughs> <laughs> and, and my dad loves Mel Gibson yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's, who's like, gonna, yeah, who's not, who doesn't want to be played yeah, by Mel yeah, yeah. yeah, so, yeah. so my dad signed the paper under the auspices that he was gonna be played by by Braveheart you know so mm -hmm. um, <laughs> well you had the Noah Bombach script but this is an autobiography so in some ways were you playing Noah in the film I mean, like all of these things, there. Noah wrote a script. He did that hat trick that people, I think, tried to do of writing something that's incredibly specific, but it reaches a broader audience. I mean, like like anything, he like Meyerowitz, like you know, Squid and the Whale. While we're young, they're all in a sense autobiographical. And then, but he wrote something that I think we all projected our our history or uh, onto. What What was the toughest moment for you in that film? Or was the one that you really struggled with? Usually there's like one scene in the in a movie or maybe two that you're dreading. With this one, every scene felt like, oh, it's all too early in the schedule. It's too early for Halloween. It's too early for <laughs> put it off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then, and like, okay, well, then we can maybe put it to next week. But then next week's was was worse, you know. So, so and that, again, that's, a, I think, a testament to good writing. Every scene felt the stakes were incredibly high. They all felt urgent. They all felt necessary. There wasn't a part that you could take out where the movie would survive without it. And uh, mm -hmm. so that, that, I think it was our first sign of, oh, oh, this felt like it always should be this 
urgent, hopefully. Last question for all of you. If you could go back to your younger selves, mm. well, you in a way went back to a younger yeah. self, yeah. 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 younger than that, yeah. Yeah. what piece of advice would you give yourself? Well, I was saying something to my grandson the other day because, uh, you know, that things just become, when things are going well, become. Don't think you're on top of the world in mm. the sense you always got to be wary because mm. I've seen it. I've seen people come. I've seen people go. I've seen them come. I've seen them go. You got to be chill. You got to like just take what's good in your life and move forward cautiously and carefully. Mm. And, and thank God that you, that you have that. Mm -hmm. Just it's very, very important not to, to overextend yourself when you when you think you, you know, you've got it. That's no such thing. Everybody's dispensable. Mm -hmm. I wish I had known that this too shall pass. Yeah. Mm. You feel bad right now? You feel pissed Ooh. off? You feel angry? Yeah, that's this good. too shall pass. Oh, great. You feel great? You feel like you know all the answers? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You feel like that everybody yeah. finally gets you yeah, and yeah. Uh, there you are? Yeah. This, this too, too shall <laughs> pass. Ooh, good. Time is your ally. Mm. And if nothing else, just wait. Just wait. Just oh, wait it out. Ooh, ooh. Just, just. I'll take Tom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For Adam. Being more economical, I think I, I would. I wish I mm. could be. You know, things that I think I need, I don't. Whether it be acting or you know life. Economical, artistically, financially, emotionally. Well, we could say artistically, I guess. If you think that you need to, uh, the, certain things have to be in place for you to do your job, but then actually none of that's true. Mm -hmm. We were mm -hmm. using the example earlier of a porthole, yeah, having it worked up in your mind, <laughs> and then realize you're getting there, you have no control over any of it. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Or doing homework and research yeah. and like, you know, losing weight and putting a bunch of weight and then feeling comfortable to let it all go because none of that is helpful because your scene partner is drunk. Or, you know, <laughs> I'm just pulling yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That's not no something name. that's happened to me. I'm just yeah. pulling something out of it. But, but being more economical with, you know, okay, well, all that time I, I have to either get better about that I've wasted it or I shouldn't just waste that time and, and actually should prioritize in a different way. So I think that's kind of the same thing. Adam. Uh, Can I say one thing? Yeah, Could you ask them to put a porthole in there? <laughs> well, yeah. Here's, you know what the thing was yeah. is that I felt as though that I was relatively common experience enough that I didn't do this. Is there anybody who could have told me that? Because <laughs> someone had put in the script, there was a lack of cornholes in this lifeboat. <laughs> I said, all right, all right, so there's no lifeboat. There's no, uh, there's no porthole. You did have that extraordinary moment everybody talked about in the film where, where you cried. And I remember you said at the last round table that you'd had 10 minutes to prepare for it. Not even that. We just kind of like went down and... We Adam, were... lost man... Sitting. I was thinking because uh, I should have stretched more. Stretch. <laughs> I have a very bad uh, <laughs> back. That, no, I can't that's get like out the of my floss answer. I should have <laughs> yeah. flossed. I, I should have flossed you more too. I think metaphorically. No, you know. no, 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 no. I'm fine. <laughs> fine with all that stuff, but I really can't get out of my car. <laughs> When there's a loose ball on a basketball court, I, I cannot say, get oh, the ball man. ever. Everyone else grabs it before me because I can't bend. So that, uh, they, and, and my coaches always growing up were like, always talking about stretching. I never did it. I never did it. I always jumped. I just jumped right into the game. Did you stretch before playing? No, not too much. <laughs> See? No, I don't. But that three ball was wet, though. I got the tape. At the t yeah, thank you. Yeah, you can right. shoot. Not as wet as it used to be. Yeah. Good, but of all of you, thank you so much. This was. It's truly a terrific round, I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it was great. Hey, I'm Charlotte LaBeouf. Hey, I'm Jamie Foxx. Hi, I'm Tom Hanks. I'm Adam Sandler. Thank you for watching Hollywood Reporter Roundtables. Roundtables on YouTube. On YouTube. I think that's the one right there. <laughs>